said about two services is that I get to hear the music twice. <laughs> I consider myself twice blessed. So the sermon this morning and the sermon next Sunday are linked, sort of. Next Sunday, let me give you a, a commercial before the sermon. Next Sunday, I'm going to preach about democracy. And part of my sermon next week, I'm going to look back. I'm going to look back to the democratic innovations of our religious forebears as Unitarian Universalists. Because it was our religious ancestors, they heroically and bravely and very imperfectly innovated the democratic process, both within congregational life and in civic life. And I've selected this topic of democracy for next Sunday because next weekend we are going to be welcoming a busload of Unitarian Universalists from All Souls UU Church in Washington, D.C., that great big church. They're going to be taking the bus down here on Friday night, and they're going to be all day Saturday participating in get out the vote and voter engagement efforts with You Can Vote. And they're going to be especially um, bringing that message of voter engagement to historically marginalized communities whose votes have been systematically suppressed. Thus, this commercial. We're still looking for another few people in our church who might like to host. And so I would like to take a moment to ask you to consider if you might be willing to host or help. One of the ways is by hosting someone in your home, which would be picking them up here at the church on Friday night around eight, between 8 and 9, bringing them back to the church on Saturday morning, and then doing the same thing on Saturday night to Sunday morning. Or if that doesn't seem like a possibility to you, you're invited to come and participate in a day of voter advocacy efforts um, for part of the day or the whole day. And if you do that, you could be paired with those uh, wonderful folks from All Souls, and you can drive them around, and you can make lifelong friendships with them. Or you can help with hospitality. We're going to have a potluck dinner for them on Saturday evening, and so perhaps you might feel in the hospitable mood and want to contribute something. And if you are feeling so moved, in the back of the sanctuary, there's some forms, there's some clipboards for signing up, and let me tell you, I have faith. <laughs> I have faith that by the time I leave church today, there will be so many sign-ups that I'm going to have to call people and turn them away. I have faith. Don't shake my faith. Don't make me lose my faith. <laughs> so next Sunday... And we're preaching about democracy. And that ties into my topic this week. Because it turns out that our same religious ancestors who heroically and bravely and very imperfectly advanced democracy were also theological innovators. The two went hand in hand. Their gift to us, I believe, is that they helped us Help to give us an enlarged sense of our own humanity, an expanded conception of the human mind and human soul. And it's that that I want to talk about this morning. One of the privileges of ministry is that I get to choose what I preach about. And this morning, my sermon is going to be a little indulgent, because I'm going to preach about an author and religious thinker who I am just absolutely smitten with and, and think is the very best, and whose thought is deep and important. The author is named Marilyn Robinson. She is the author of ten books. Among those are four novels. Her second novel, Gilead, won the Pulitzer Prize. And she's also published six works of nonfiction, most of which are essays and lectures having to do with theology and history. Here's how Marilyn Robinson introduces herself in one of the essays in her most recent book. She says, Recently, I read a brief overview of myself and my work, an article on the internet. It said that if someone were bioengineered to personify unhipness, 
the result would be Marilyn Robinson. The writer listed the qualities that have earned me this distinction. I am in my 70s. I was born in Idaho. I live in Iowa. I teach in a public university. And I am a self-professed Calvinist. That's one way to describe herself. Here's another. At some point in 2015, the New York Times Review of Books called up President Obama and proposed to him that he interview a writer of his choice. His choice was to fly to Iowa to interview Marilyn <coughs> Robinson. Earlier that year, Obama had traveled to South Carolina during that awful week to eulogize the victims and speak words of comfort to the country following those horrible, horrible murders of nine members of a Bible study at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston at the hands of a white supremacist. In the eulogy that he gave, President Obama quoted one author, Marilyn Robinson, asking us as a nation to summon in her words, quote, that reservoir of goodness beyond and of another kind that we are able to do each other in the ordinary cause of things. That reservoir of goodness beyond and of another kind that we are able to do each other in the ordinary cause of things. That's how she writes. Marilyn Robinson spent her career teaching writing at the Iowa Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa our country's most prestigious creative writing program. In one of her essays, she describes an interaction in her class that she found troubling. Let me share it with you. She writes, all this came up recently in a writing class when I asked the students to describe their assumptions about human motivation it became clear that a number of them took for granted that the substratum of all behavior was self-interest. This understood as gratification of certain of those uncountenanced impulses Freud had in mind. Now my students, my students are excellent, large-spirited people, really exemplary. There is no reason to suppose that either reflection or experience would have led them to so dim a view of their kind. But this notion of human nature was taught to them as true, and good students that most of them are, they've accepted it as true. And it has had significant consequences for their fiction. Specifically, characters they understand to be outside the effective range of social formation tend to gratify uncountenanced impulses with a high degree of predictability. And true to the Freudian paradigm, highly socialized, which is to say middle class characters, tend to dwell in the moral twilight of essentially contentless decency, which they frequently depart from in search of a truer self. This passage would be humorous, is humorous, but also troubling. If this view of human nature were restricted to just creative writing students, it would be bad news for fans of fiction, but otherwise insignificant. However, this worldview is not just observed in writing classes. What we've lost, Marilyn Robinson writes, we've impoverished ourselves by imagining, by believing that self-interest is what motivates all human activity and that our lives are, we live our lives operating with this assumption and that's bad for us. Robinson is troubled as I am by habits of thought that diminish the vastness and splendor of human beings. She writes, one thing theology must do now is to reconsider and reject the kind of thinking that tends to devalue humankind, which is an influential tendency in modern culture, one that, coincident, one that not coincidentally runs parallel to the decline of religion. She writes, this devaluing of the species puts aside everything interesting about us as irrelevant to the question of our true nature. So she, she writes this way. Robinson identifies numerous habits of thought that she says leave our humanity diminished. 
These include, she says, how we think and talk about economics, including the assumption that greed and narrowly understood self-interest are the natural default setting of the human condition. And these include reductionist habits of thought that diminish the capacity for human agency and deny the idea of a mind and a soul. What are we doing here, she asks. What are we doing here? And if the answer to that question is something simple and base, then our, diminished, then our humanity is diminished. And if the answer to that question is lofty and large, then our humanity is enriched. Let me say what I mean by this. Marilyn Robinson lives in Iowa City, Iowa. It's a university town. It's the Chapel Hill of Iowa, if you will. Although not as cool as Chapel Hill. <laughs> How many people have ever been to Iowa City, Iowa? Anybody? Yeah. So it is this, it's this tiny, tiny town. And instead of being like part of a, you know, the triangle next to, um, next to cities like Durham and, and Raleigh, it is just in the middle of, of cornfields. It's this tiny town, and the, the, next, the next big city is Des Moines one way or, or Chicago the other, and those are a bit of a drive. So she writes, one of the things she writes about, she writes about the origins of her university. It was founded in 1847, 50 years later than UNC. So I want you to picture Iowa. You've got a state where in 1847, most of the people were farmers. Most of the people are, are still farmers in Iowa. That's still the dominant industry. And they decide in 1847 that they are going to create a university right in the middle of the state. And this university that they create, they create a university where the crown jewel of the university, its biggest contribution, what it's most known for, is its arts. It's drama, music, theater, literature, creative writing, and the humanities as well, and the sciences, and later comes the professional schools teaching people how to be doctors and lawyers and engineers and business people and so on. Marilyn Robinson finds this meaningful. Such a school was not created by a bunch of cosmopolitan bon vivants. We can imagine that if you know, folks in Brooklyn got together to just create a university, they might create a university, but, but it was paid for and created by a bunch Practical, rational, decent farmers who said emphatically, we want poetry and painting and plays. She takes this as evidence of a certain kind of largeness of mind in the sense of what it means to be human in this generous worldview that values beauty. It is a generous worldview that values beauty. It's an expansive idea of the human. And Marilyn Robinson contrasts this view of grandeur with contemporary attacks upon education in her state and elsewhere, attempts to starve public institutions of funding. Austerity, she writes, is the worldview of a diminished humanity which says that the highest good is amassing as much wealth as possible, paying as little taxes as possible, that self-interest is the highest law, and cost-benefit analysis is the supreme measure of worth for our being. And if that's the case, if that view of humanity is true, then public institutions are unsupportable and must be done away with. says that how we think about our humanity, is our humanity something complex and beautiful, or is it something simple and diminished? Here's a little history. As Unitarian Universalists, our religious tradition stretches back to revolutionary America, and then farther back to colonial New England, and then farther back to the ra radical reformation in England, the, the Puritans and the Quakers, and the levelers and the diggers and the Wycliffeites. 
and back as well to the Reformation in Europe, including to John Calvin in Geneva. One of the things that most Unitarian Universalists don't know is that before we were Unitarian Universalists, before we were Emersonian Transcendentalists, before we were American religious revolutionaries, we were Puritans and Calvinists, which is an interesting part of our history to reckon with. I mean, if someone were to call you a Puritan or a Calvinist, they would be trying to insult you, and you would take it as an insult, right? And so part of what endears me to Marilyn Robinson as an author is her willingness to delve into this kind of rejected history with generosity and insight and compassion. It was, after all, say whatever you will about it, this religious, intellectual, cultural, and political movement that was the first in world history to embrace the goal of universal literacy. Out of this religious, intellectual, cultural, and political movement came printing presses and universities and literacy. And then, with Unitarianism, the goal of universal public education, Horace Mann. The theological underpinning of all of this, the democratic reforms, the political reforms, the educational reforms, the religious reforms, was a sense deeply felt that we are all children of the divine, all part of something happening which is rich and strange and complex. And to diminish ourselves, to diminish our humanity, was in fact to diminish God, because they believe that we are made in the image of God. Robinson writes with appreciation of scientific understandings that point to richness and complexity. She likes to point out that there are about as many neurons in each human brain as there are stars in the Milky Way, somewhere between 100 and 200 billion. Where's that million? I'll Google that. Billion? Billion. 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 She likes to reference concepts from physics, such as dark matter, which Josh was kind enough to explain to me before the service, which helps us to understand how little we understand. She writes disparagingly of theories of the human that diminish us, that tell us our lives are determined by our race or by our genes or by the shape of our brains. Marilyn Robinson's newest book, ends with perhaps the most personal piece of writing she's ever published. It's a sermon she delivered at an Episcopalian church in Little Rock, Arkansas, a year ago. The title of the sermon is Slander. And by, and by slander, she doesn't mean just to speak ill of someone. She means to speak ill of our shared humanity. She begins the sermon by talking about her mother's last years, her death at the age of 82. She describes her mother as sharp-minded, aware, proud of her intelligence, and she describes the friendship and relationship that she has rebuilt with her mother, that eventually the reconnection they eventually had. And then Marilyn goes on, Marilyn Robinson goes on to describe how her mother changed. And that relationship was severed when her mother became addicted to Fox News. Here's what she writes in this sermon. Toward the end of her life, my mother began to be tormented by anxieties and regrets. I, her daughter, became one of those who had ruined America. So she told me. I would go to hell for it too, a fact she considered both regrettable and just. A mother less Fox saturated might have taken satisfaction from degrees and prizes, but to her they were proof that I was in league with the sinister other. My mother lived out the end of her fortunate life in a state of bitterness and panic, never having had the slightest brush with any experience that would confirm her in these emotions. 
By slander, Robinson does not just mean the attacks against people. She does not mean her own mother disowning her, accusing her of a falsehood that bears no resemblance to the truth. In this sermon, Marilyn Robinson shares that she travels and speaks, and she speaks frequently at Christian colleges and Christian universities. And she says that frequently Christians will come up to her and wonder about the persecution she must face as a Christian author. She has to laugh at that. Persecution, you mean the tenured professorship at the best writing program in the country, the Pulitzer Prize, and a Presidential Medal of Freedom. <laughs> she shares that as she travels and speaks frequently, Christians come up to her and ask her, is she afraid? Is she afraid to teach at such a heathen, God-forsaken public university like the University of I want to take just a moment here. I'm going to go, go a couple minutes over, but but I once heard um, I once were, went to go hear a theologian about a, maybe a decade ago named Brian McLaren. Brian McLaren is a Christian author. Um, he was um, he's an evangelical. He's self self described as an evangelical Christian, and he was ranked by Time Magazine as one of the the 20 most influential evangelicals around around 2005. And um, but then he was. Um, simultaneously accused of heresy. I mean, he was regarded as, as a heretic. And um, he was regarded as a heretic because he dared to assert that God's love for humanity is, is bigger and that God's love extends to those who are not doctrinally pure as well as to gays and lesbians. And this got him branded as a heretic. So I went to go hear Brian McLaren <coughs> speak. And um, he's this guy, and he's, he's bald, and he has this black um, turtleneck that comes up really high, and he's just this gentle, gentle man. And so as he's beginning his lecture, people in the audience run up to the front of the room and to shout him down, holding the Bible. They, they shout Bible passages at him. And so they go, John 3.16, da 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 and shout at him. And he would just say, I don't disagree with anything you just said. And that was his response. And it, it went on for a while, and then, and then he gave part of a lecture. And then the lecture ended. And I just had to go to the reception after this. And so I went to the reception, which was the most awkward reception in the world, because he was speaking at a Christian college, and, and most of the audience, the audience had either you know, walked out or shouted him down, and, and there wasn't a huge amount of support for him in the room. And so I go over, he's just standing in the corner eating a cookie all alone, and I go over to him and I say, Thank you very much for your lecture. I'm a, I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister, and, and I really appreciated what you had to say. And he says, oh, the Unitarians. You all are so kind to me. <laughs> and and I, I love that. I don't agree. I don't disagree with anything you just said. I don't disagree with anything you just said. By slander, Marilyn Robinson means a smallness of thought that dehumanizes, a smallness of thought that bears false witness against humanity and false witness against God. By slander, she means a smallness of thought that diminishes humanity, a smallness of thought that bears false witness against humanity and false witness against God. Amen. Thank you for listening to my indulgent sermon. Bless you. Sign up. <laughs>
I have faith. <laughs> We're going to sing a hymn that I, that I love. Um, it's a hymn uh, out, of the, out of the Christian tradition. My life flows on. In the song number 108, I invite you to rise in body and spirit as we sing. 